Mr. Tice, lovely to see to you this morning. Thank you. Now, do you agree with Lee Anderson, who said that Rishi Sunak missed the later D-Day ceremony at Omaha Beach because his grandparents didn't fight in World War II? Who knows why Rishi Sunak uh, missed those uh, commemorations? Frankly, it was just a shocking decision for everybody. And uh, one can only speculate. I have no idea. Uh, I don't think anybody has an idea, but it was a catastrophic uh, decision, which, frankly, has, has shamed and embarrassed the nation. Um, can we talk about some of your candidates, Mr Tice? So I read today in the Mail on Sunday that somebody you had deselected has now been reselected. Guy Lachlan, St Neots and Mid Cams. Is he back on the slate for reform? I'd have to check, Camilla. We've got 611 candidates. I don't know exactly all of them on every single constituency, but, uh, you know, our team have been looking at all of this. There's been all sorts of uh, allegations and out-of-context stuff put to uh, put to us. So okay. uh, we'll have to check well, that, well, obviously, we can come back to you. Well, let's... OK, let me just put it to you perhaps a different way. This is somebody who's liked to tweet for the far-right Britain First group against Muslims. He's liked another tweet saying Tommy Robinson isn't entirely wrong. Yeah. He suggested Camilla, Camilla, that there are too Camilla, many people on the planet. Camilla, he said Camilla, that humanity is bacteria. Camilla, I'm going to stop you there. Camilla, I'm should stop he you be there, a candidate okay? is my question, Camilla, Mr Tice. I'm going to stop you there. The Mail on Sunday is running a vindictive campaign against us. A whole load of stuff gets put to us by journalists out of context with no notice, some of which turns out to be completely and utterly wrong. If people have got allegations, they send them to us and we check it. But we're not going to respond to stuff live on air. I've literally been given misinformation by a very okay, well-known but... journalist on a different broadcasting channel in order to try and trap us. So, Camilla, with the, night, with the greatest of respect, I'm not going to respond to something live on air without formal, uh, you know, something formally sent to us that we can check. Sorry, I thought you might have seen it because it was in this morning's papers. Um, I, I'm only picking I, him I out because you had deselected him. As you well him. know, that doesn't mean it's true. No, but I'm saying that I'm picking this guy out particularly. I'm not part of some conspiracy, uh, Mr Tice. I'm just a journalist. I'm picking this guy out because you deselected him because you were so worried about his tweets. And now it seems as if he is the candidate for that seat. And that seems we, to be we, slightly <coughs> contradictory. You've deselected him and now you've reselected him. We will check it out. I don't have 611 names on my, uh, on, on my, uh, on my mind. We'll check it out. A whole load of stuff that the Mail on Sunday have been printing is, frankly, ludicrous, gotcha, garbage. OK. Um, have you only got 611, then? You're a bit short. Uh, you wanted we've got 630. Got yeah, we've got 611. We've got uh, nine candidates where we've got joint candidates with the SDP. And one of the reasons that actually we got a bit short, for example, in this constituency of Stone, uh, we, our candidates submitted their papers and then something extraordinary happened. We've no idea what, but I have to say it's very, very dodgy. He then withdrew them with a few minutes to spare and endorsed the Conservative candidate. So, frankly, some of the Conservatives have been playing very, very dirty tricks, trying to bribe our candidates uh, to step aside. And that's why we've right. lost a number of candidates at the last minute. And frankly, I think they need to explain themselves. Although it's not just the Conservatives playing dirty tricks, is it? That's your candidate also playing dirty tricks. Funnily enough, this was reported in the Mail on Sunday, so this story isn't garbage. So uh, say that again. The, this the, the story, story was the... reported in the Mail yeah, on the... Sunday, so this is one story about reform and having someone defect to the Tories. That story, just to confirm, isn't garbage or indeed a stitch-up. It was actually reported yesterday in other papers, and the Mail on Sunday just picked it up. Uh, look, oh, that, they might not story... get it first, but at least they get it last. Well, yeah, and maybe sometimes the last are actually two. Right, OK, so this guy's defected because he agrees with the Rishi Sunak press premise that a vote for reform is a vote for Labour. It's not no, really a winning be... endorsement, is it, of he, reform? He's, he's done it because he's been promised something, I've no doubt whatsoever. We had other what candidates will he have been who... promised? Oh, we had another candidate who was promised a safe council seat and two jobs by the Conservatives. This sort of dirty trick is one of the reasons why the Tories are going to absolutely bomb in this election, because the British public are sick and tired of their mm. antics, their dirty tricks. And actually, they want people to tell it as it is and come up with policies that are going to work for Britain to make work pay, to get to zero waiting lists, to freeze immigration. No one voted for mass immigration. 
and to stop the lawlessness on our streets. And those are the policies that we're campaigning out. And we're getting a fantastic response on the, street, on the streets. Let me tell you, maybe, there are a lot maybe of time he was worried. M- maybe he was worried, Mr Tice, that he was going to go to bed with Nigel Farage and wake up with Angela Rayner. Um, I think that's a vision that's a little bit too tricky for most people early in the morning. <laughs> well, not really. It's that the idea that you vote for a form and unfortunately you wake up with Labour. That's what your candidate has been worried about. That's why he's jumped ship. No, exactly the opposite. Let me tell you what's really going on out there. Everybody realises that Labour are going to win this election. Don't like it, but that's the reality. So now, actually, it's a free opportunity because if you vote Tory, you're going to get Labour anyway. So you might as well use that opportunity to punish the Tories for the damage they've done to our country over the last 14 years. And actually, Mm. a vote for Reform is a vote for change, and that's why we're going up in the polls. The Tories are sinking the polls. We're doing so well. We're going to win seats. We're going to get many millions of votes. I'm increasingly confident that we're going to get more votes cast than the Conservative Party, and that's the big target. That's the opportunity. Okay. Um, Let's go through some of your policies then. How does net zero immigration work when it comes to the health and social care sector? So our policy is to freeze immigration with the exception of Ah. uh, health and social care, Okay, But basically, about half a million people leave the UK every year, so you can welcome a similar number, highly qualified, highly skilled, above the average national wage, including a much lower number of students doing proper degrees, not ridiculous uh, degrees that, frankly, are pretty useless. Um, That's the way we should do it. And What about other shortages, though? Well, like, for instance, uh, chefs. Short... It's very difficult for people in hospitality I'm sorry, I'm sorry. to get chefs. No, what... no, Camilla, the role of the British government and British businesses is to train up and develop and motivate young British people coming out of school and getting into work. That's how it used to work in the 1990s and 1980s, when we had almost no immigration whatsoever. And guess what? It worked rather well. We had, higher re- we had real wage growth. Everybody felt better off. And we didn't have huge pressure on housing rents, unaffordable yeah. housing. Huge pressure on healthcare. So actually, by freezing the size of the population, everybody's quality of life will improve and also wages will go up, people will feel a little better off. And I think that's a very okay. good thing and not what most British citizens want. Um, since Nigel Farage came in and took your job, he's dropped the overseas detention plan for migrants. Are you going to stick with your migrant tax on businesses? Because when I last interviewed you, we had Soroka Forte on, who's a leading hotelier. He employs a lot of foreigners, and he said it was a, quote, crazy idea. And he's wrong. It's actually a very good idea. And of course we're going to stick to it. We only announced it, uh, I think, about 12 days ago. It's part of what I've just been referring to, which is motivating and enthusing young British Mm. people coming out of school uh, in order to get into the world of work. And what's actually happened is for too long, businesses have been able to suppress and depress wages, not pay for training, uh, and therefore actually wages haven't seen the sort of growth that we saw in the 1980s and 1990s. When actually uh, those sort of businesses, hospitality businesses, they were employing lots of English workers. And that's what we've got to do. That's the role and frankly, moral obligation of big business. And that's that's the obligation of what the government should be doing. So we've had a very good response to that from people up and down the country. We've got some exemptions for small businesses, five people and less. I know, but it's not going to affect... It's not not the big businesses that are going to struggle to cope, is it? It's the small and medium-sized businesses that have over five employees. I mean, you're talking about businesses with under five employees. They're micro-businesses. They're not small and medium-sized businesses. Literally, for 150 years, this is how economics worked. If you can't afford the labour... You invest in capital equipment more to get more productivity to replace the labour. When all of a sudden we had mass immigration in the last 20 years, we've had a productivity crisis, a capital investment crisis, and we've had almost zero real wage growth. In fact, I think for the last 15 years, real wages have declined a bit. So the proof's in the pudding. The mass immigration makes people poorer and worse off. And businesses have a role and responsibility to play their part in training up and developing and paying a proper wage for young British workers. And we do not resile one bit, not one iota from that. It's absolutely vital. Okay, Mr Tice, finally, can you give us your top three policies that you hope will reform the NHS? Uh, Yes, I can. Uh, The first thing is we've got to retain and uh, um, we've got to retain and attract back recently departed staff. 
Uh, we've got to use the independent healthcare sector much more. The NHS has got to buy millions more appointments and operations. And thirdly, here's the thing. Actually, if you can afford to pay a bit more, and of course, this would all still be at the three at the point of delivery. That's absolutely critical. I have no doubts about that. But if you can afford to pay a bit more, actually, it would help the NHS, free up pressure on the NHS, if we encourage people to pay a bit more and buy their own health insurance or self-pay by giving them tax relief, basic rate tax relief, at 20%, that would ease the pressure on the NHS, which means that there would be, everybody would get faster, better outcomes. And we set out in our contract how you pay for that. Someone's got to have the ambition, and we've got it, to get to zero waiting lists in two years. Most other nations don't have lots of waiting lists. And as Nigel quite rightly said in the leaders' debates, we've got to be brave enough to say other nations are doing it much better, still free at the point of delivery. I repeat, for those who sort of say we want to do other things, but we have to have reform the way we do healthcare in the United Kingdom. Will you charge for missed appointments, Mr Tice? And that's a detail that, I, to be honest, I haven't looked at. Lots of people get excited about it. The bigger picture is, is actually, Camilla, that we've got to reform the way we do healthcare. We've got to be much more ambitious, use the independent sector much, much more, let that grow. Here's mm. the thing. It's, by the way, a conservative principle. Competition's a good thing. It drives up standards, it drives down costs, and it increases capacity, which means we'll all be treated better, faster, and have healthier outcomes. And so that will improve our cancer diagnosis. OK. When's the manifesto out? Uh, we're looking at about um, eight to nine days. It's a contract, Camilla. It's not a manifesto. Manifestos is full of broken promises. We don't believe in those. OK.